morning. Good morning. Man, aren't you grateful for the worship uh, that we've had this morning? Praise the Lord for the team, man. Weren't they weren't fantastic leadership? Let me uh, give you a report. The last couple of weeks, we um, actually have been just continuing to receive gifts for the, um, the offering we had. If you remember, we had an emphasis about two weeks ago for a special offering for Dunning Baptist Church, a, uh, a, a revitalization partnership with a church in downtown Greenville. And we had a, a specific thing we were given to, if you remember, the HVAC system, so air conditioning and, and, and heat for the church kind of moving forward because the, the system was just gone. And uh, we had a goal of $45,000. And I say that and remind, it, uh, remind you of it just in case there's still some who haven't been able to, to give because we've almost got it. Uh, up to this point, we have collected $41,000 toward that. And that's a blessing, man. Would you celebrate that together? That's great. And so... I'll be with them today from 2 o'clock to 5 o'clock. I'll be sitting around uh, a room with their vision team talking about the future of Dunning and the future of Greenville, uh, Greenville downtown uh, Greenville. And uh, so be praying for Stephen and for Calvin and that whole team this afternoon as I'll be able to celebrate that with them as well. Um, man, we came out of uh, a series uh, last Sunday, just a two-week kind of a snapshot series called Can We Talk?, and in that, if you remember, we talked very intentionally about uh, this transformation that took place um, at salvation. And if you're new here, I'd encourage you to go back and watch those two weeks, uh, just messages. You could actually go and watch Five Forks Campus Pastor, Harrison Bridge Campus Pastor, or downtown. But those messages really gear us toward pre preparing our hearts uh, for contentious times like the election season, um, but how to be a Christian and how to be consistent in all of that. Well, in that message series, 2 Corinthians 5.17 was the whole, the whole point, really. And that is that we had a radical transformation that took place. If we're Christians, we're not just church people, we're not just religious, but we're Christians. We're actually followers of Jesus. Then there was a moment in time when we, we were changed. We were radically transformed by the power of God. And that change that took place actually led then to some different actions. And so we start living our lives based on the change that took place. It shouldn't be the other way around. We don't, we don't do things in order to be a Christian. So you're not, you're not gonna become a Christian by going to church. You're not gonna become a Christian by being a good person. If that's what you think, then I promise you, you've got a lot uh, to learn about what Christians are supposed to believe. Because Christians really recognize the only way they come uh, to salvation is, is by faith in Jesus Christ, the work that he did on the cross. So that transformation that took place in, in our lives at salvation, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away, behold, the new has come. So in other words, that's why we say we've been born again. At new birth, we become a different person, literally changed identity. And our identity is no longer based on us, it's based on Jesus. So as a result of that, coming out of that, now just practically, not just Super Tuesday or whatever, you know, not just, hey, you know, election day is going to be Tuesday and when we get past that, uh, we're good. And maybe everybody's thinking, you know, I, I, was, I was able to maintain my testimony even in the midst of a contentious time. But here's the deal, really that idea, we should grow out of that. We should grow out of, out of this idea of, okay, transformation leads to attitude change, it leads to, you know, I guess even you could say our, our function of Christianity should change. But, but that happens in something we call spiritual disciplines. Now, that's a, a, a kind of a Christian word, a churchy word. It's not, it's not necessarily a term that's found in Scripture. But the, the word is, is designated for things that are found in Scripture. All right? These are disciplines in the Christian faith that help us continue to grow in faith in Christ. Because here's the deal. Nothing that we, we do in the Christian faith is just a one and done. So even though, yes, you're justified and you're saved when, you're, when you come to faith in Christ, the fact of the matter is you're not finished growing. I mean, this is a process. This is a journey that we call faith. And so we're regularly learning more about God. He's taking more and more of our lives over as we surrender to him. And so our growth process, it starts at salvation, but it grows until the day we die. And so with that in mind, these next six weeks are going to be pretty, pretty important because these are six specific ways that we should be disciplined in our spiritual life. Today in particular, we're talking about prayer and fasting. All right. And so that, that'll give you an idea, prayer and fasting. Next Sunday, Pat's going to be speaking 
to us on scripture reading and how the word of God should matter to us and how we should have a disciplined, consistent way to read the Bible on our own and not depend on just uh, uh, Sunday morning messages or connect group lessons. And, uh, and then we're going to get into worship the third week, another spiritual discipline, serving other people week four. And then week five, we're going to talk about sharing the gospel. We're going to try to be extremely practical and talk about not just, oh, you should share your faith, but how we can personally share our faith with people and in a practical way in a relational way, maybe even talking about neighboring and, and caring for those who are in our, our neighborhood and community. But then finally, we'll talk about uh, being generous people. So all of those things are related to spiritual disciplines we should have. And so today, one of the most elementary basic ideas in the Christian faith, and that is we should be people of prayer. Now, all of this really backs up to an idea that comes out of a lot of different epistles that Paul wrote. These are letters that Paul wrote to different churches. Well, the church at Galatia was a church that uh, he spoke directly to related to a walking in the spirit. In Galatians chapter five and verse 16, let me just read this for you. And, and hey, while I'm reading this, would you go ahead and be finding Matthew chapter six? Go ahead and turn in, turn on your Bibles, Matthew chapter six. That's where we're gonna be in just a moment. But I wanna refresh your memory of what Paul says in Galatians chapter five, verse 16. He said, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. He draws a contrast. He's like, you're either gonna walk in the spirit or you're gonna walk in the flesh. He goes on to say, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you wanna do. Verse 24, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. That flesh is the old man. That's, that's who we've died to, all right? We've crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Doesn't mean we're perfect, but it does mean that we're delivered. And then verse 25, if we live by, by the spirit, let us also walk by the spirit. And so if nothing else we see in that passage, here's what Paul does. He draws a distinction in living and walking. And so this idea of walking with the Lord, if you've ever heard somebody talk about that, and you may have been like, what are they talking about, walking with the Lord? It's kind of like, it's just saying like, that it's not just one thing to live by the Spirit. Living by the Spirit comes when you're saved, you're justified. So when you prayed to receive Jesus as your Savior, you said, God, forgive me of my sins, save me. Then you began to live by the Spirit. This is, this is a, uh, a radical change in identity, live by the Spirit. But walking by the Spirit is something entirely different. It's, it's, a, it's a result of living by the Spirit. And here's the thing that's, that's a little bit of a distinction here, or maybe a major distinction. You live by the Spirit only because Jesus Christ is the one empowering you. In fact, he, gave, he died on the cross. Had he not died on the cross, we couldn't possibly have been saved. Salvation is not of us at all. Salvation is of God. He is the one who gives us salvation. Now, even though that is true of justification, sanctification is we grow in Christ, you may say, well, yeah, but you can't grow in Christ without the power of God either. And I would say you're right, but this is very much more of an issue of my commitment, much more of an issue of my responsibility. I am responsible for my own walk with God. All right, so while I, I'm living by the Spirit because Jesus died on the cross and, and I just said yes to his offer of salvation, my walk with Jesus is definitely dependent on my discipline in the practices of my faith. So I have to make the decision, the conscious decision to be committed to my faith. And I have to make the conscious decision, I'm gonna be a praying man. I'm gonna be a faithful giver. I'm gonna be uh, faithful to worship God. I mean, those are conscious decisions that yes, the power of God gives me the ability, but it's a decision I'm making. It's a commitment that I'm making. And so with that in mind, we understand Paul's making this decision, this distinction, I'm sorry, that there's a difference in living by the Spirit and walking by the Spirit. We understand this even thinking about a, a new baby walking. And if you've got kids or maybe you've got nieces and nephews and you've watched them learn to walk, you totally know what I'm talking about because, man, you don't, you don't just like snap your fingers and say, hey, they turned eight months old or 10 months old or 12 months old, they're gonna walk today. No, that's not what it happened. I mean, it's like a process. It's a process of learning to walk. I can remember really all of them, but Will jumps out in my mind because he was the first, you know? And so I can remember Will would, would be holding on to something and, and then he'd get a little boldness and he'd start trying to take a step and, and it's like he'd, he'd, he'd take a half a step, boom, fall on his face, you know? And it's funny, then we would almost cheer. It's like, oh, he walked, 
not really, he fell. You know, he fell gracefully. But anyway, you know, but, but it was like, you want to cheer them on because they're crying and they're like, holding, oh, you know, but, and, but, but then they stand up again. See, if you quit, if you fall one time and you quit, then you never learn to walk. But all of us know that, that the kid gets back up, dusts himself off and, and he stands up again and eventually gets the courage to take that step again. Next time it's maybe two steps. Next time it's maybe three steps. And eventually they, they take three steps and grab onto something else, you know? And it's, it's like this fun, cheerful, terrifying process of learning to walk. Learning to walk with Jesus is really no different. I mean, you're gonna fall. You're not, gonna, you're not going to be an immediate success in the efforts that you have. But it's crazy in the Christian faith, it seems like we get we were very impatient with the pro- progress. And so while we, we may take a step and fall, many, many Christians get back up and they, they never walk again. It's like they just decide, well, that's not working. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just not good at that. I mean, I prayed, but it was weird, you know? I, just, I don't know if I, I'm just maybe not, a, you know, hey, I, I tried to start giving, but it just didn't work out. So I'll just spend it on me from now on, you know? Not gonna be generous. So here's the deal. If we, if we don't look at it like the process of learning to walk, then we're missing the point because we, we have to learn to walk in the spirit and it requires discipline. It requires discipline for us to learn how to live the life that God has called us to live. With all of that in mind, today we're talking specifically about prayer and fasting. And so let's look in Matthew chapter six, look there with me at verse five. In beginning verse five, these are the words of Jesus. And uh, I I know I've preached the sermon, um, actually, I'm sorry, I've preached uh, the Lord's prayer, the model prayer before. And so if you have been here for the five years I've been here, you may have heard the Lord's prayer. This is different this time because what we're gonna do, we're gonna read the whole passage And I'm not even going to preach or teach on the actual model prayer that's in this passage. I'm going to preach on the verses that are uh, before it and the verses that are after it. We're going to look at really practical uh, principles. You could call them directives, all right? We're going to look for three simple practical directives that are found here in this passage that are on like bookends to the model prayer found in Matthew 6. So this is the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is preaching to a multitude of people. Um, Matthew 5 through 7 is the Sermon on the Mount. So we're looking specifically at chapter 6, verse 5. And here's what he says. And when you pray, you must not be like hypocrites. Don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen of other people. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they are, uh, that they will be heard for their many words. They're trying to impress people with eloquent, eloquence. Uh, do not be like them. And those five words are pretty important. When Jesus says, don't be like somebody, we should look at it. Do not be like them. For your father knows what you need even before you ask him. Pray then like this. Here's what we refer to as the Lord's Prayer or the model prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like hypocrites. Do not be like them. Remember? Uh, gloomy like hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward, but when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your father who's in secret and your father who sees in secret, secret will reward you openly. So let's start first of all with just some a common sense observation. There's common sense observation as you read this passage that this is obviously not if, but when. This is not an if thing, but a when thing. This is, this is an imperative, all right? So here's what we mean. This is a non-negotiable thing for Christians because this is Jesus talking, not that the words of Paul are not inspired. We believe all scripture is inspired. 
We believe that all of it's true. But having said that, when Jesus is speaking, it makes me lean in a little more. All right. I'm, I'm definitely leaning into what Jesus is saying. And Jesus is not saying, hey, if you pray, Wayne, then think about doing it this way. You know, he's actually saying when you pray. Check it out. Look at verse five. Look at verse six and verse seven. All three verses start with the words, when you pray. Not if, but when you pray. If that's not enough, look at verse 16 to 17. This is tougher for me, your overeating pastor, all right? Because it's not only if and when you pray, but when you fast. What's that mean? <laughs> well, specifically, that means you're, you're sacrificing. In the case of biblical context, you're, you're choosing not to eat and you are replacing that which you desperately need for nutrition purposes, food. You're replacing your need physically for food with your need spiritually for God. And so in context of the day, we may not get to this later, so let me just go and say this. From a fasting perspective, you may say, well, that was old school. I just think that's biblical school, all right? So we should be people who fast. This should be a practice that we have that when we're serious about prayer and we really have a desperate need or when we just want to acknowledge God and our need for him, that we go through a practice of fasting. It doesn't have to always be fasting food, even though obviously in some of our cases that would be the best choice. <laughs> but, but you know what? You can fast social media, probably a great idea. You know, you can, you, here's the thing. Anything you give up that, that you enjoy, Anything you give up that you need, maybe that's a, a subjectively defined term when it comes to social media, right? But anything, maybe it's technology in general. Maybe it's television. Maybe it's the internet. I mean, look, it would be such a massive spiritual thing for us to choose those things that are maybe most important to us, that, that we enjoy the most, and make a conscious choice. God, I'm going to take the place, the time that I would normally have given to this activity, and I'm gonna replace it with time with you. That's what fasting is. So it's legitimately sacrificing something we love and joy and need with time with God, with prayer. And so with that in mind, we say it's not a question of if we fast, if we pray, but when we fast and when we pray. For all else that Christianity is, at its core, our faith is a relationship with God. And I know we all know that. We talk about that all the time. I mean, that's, that's something we actually get right conceptually is we understand, yeah, hey, our, our faith, Christianity is about a relationship. It's not about a religion. And so we don't believe that going to church saves us. We don't believe that going to church makes us holy. We believe that the God of the relationship we have actually is who makes us holy. And this is the place we come to worship him with, with his people. This is a biblical thing. But we recognize our relationship with God is the primary thing that actually makes us a follower of Christ. And so here's the deal. Common sense would say a relationship without communication is no relationship at all. So if I'm not praying or if I'm not even a regular person of prayer, like I don't have a consistent prayer time, a lifestyle of prayer, then there's a problem. There's a problem in the communication I have with God and, and understand that that means then there's a problem with my relationship with God because communication is natural for people who have a relationship. I mean, the person I love more than anybody on the planet is Amy. And I promise you, if I neglect the communication with her, I have definitely caused a problem with the relationship. And I think the same is true with God. We, we try to complicate our relationship with God, but it's really in very, very real sense the same thing that, that we have a relationship with God and he, because of the Father sending the Son, Jesus down the cross, we now have an opportunity to communicate with the God of the universe. And so when we choose not to communicate with him, we're, we're choosing to have a bad relationship with God. That makes zero sense. But it, it, it absolutely would be the case if we neglect that. Listen to what Charles Spurgeon said about prayer. He said, I know of no better thermometer to your spiritual temperature than this, the measure of the intensity of your prayer. So here's what Spurgeon would say. Spurgeon would say, man, if you are a Christian, you should have a strong prayer life. There's no better way to measure how faithful you are to God or how strong your Christian faith is rather than your prayer life. So here's three directives, real quick. We're gonna just talk about three particular directives, three things we can be 
in order to work on our prayer lives. The first one is simple, but I think the most impactful for me. Our prayer life should be sincere. Our prayer life should be sincere. And if you don't know it, you can pull up the app, our church app has notes. You can follow along and actually fill in the blanks, email yourself the notes. It's really helpful. I should have said that at the front end. But the first blank there is be sincere. How, how can we know we're sincere? Well, I think that's uh, obviously, again, a personal thing. It's a subjective thing. Only you know if you're being sincere. But I think we would all admit there have been times where we've not been sincere in our prayers, where maybe unintentionally we've just become extremely ritualistic, ceremonial, mechanical. We've just kind of prayed the same prayer. I remember when I was a kid going to bed, I'd pray the same prayer every night. I mean, not just the whole like, I remember uh, originally I used, to, I used to say, you know, this really, really memorized prayer. Um, now lay me down to sleep, pray the Lord my soul to keep. You know, did y'all do that? Anybody? If I die before I wake, how terrifying of a prayer for a child to learn, you know? <laughs> if I die before I wake, wait, daddy, what, you know? You taught me to pray this? But anyway, you know, I, that's, we all, we all kind of learn our own little prayers. Maybe you didn't learn that one. But that, that's the one I prayed probably until I was a little older, older child. And, but then eventually I, I learned a, a new way to pray. And, uh, and, and, you know, I think for years, I don't think I started a prayer for, for years that didn't start with Dear Heavenly Father. It's because I, I probably heard some deacon pray like that. Dear Heavenly Father, we'll come to you today. You know, that's how we pray. You got to pray in a certain way. Anyway, I just... I don't know what that is. I'm just saying that uh, there was a weird way that I pray. Even when uh, I remember I, I really got a, a life change, a heart change, came back to Christ after years of being away. And so about 21 years old, uh, I, uh, I started uh, uh, really getting faithful to God again. And the first thing they do when you become faithful to God is they make you an usher, at least back in that day. And so I had to be an usher. And so I ushed. And so when I was back, I was so worried. I was worried, terrified about the possibility of walking down the aisle uh, to, to stand there with the plates. Do you remember how, I don't know if y'all went to churches like this, but I used to go to church where we'd walk down and stand right in front of the pulpit with the plates there. And, you know, we'd wait on the pastor and the pastor would call on somebody's like Russian roulette. It was scary, man. You had no idea, you know, you had no idea if he's going to be the one. And so I'd be, I mean, I was 21 years old and I'm sitting here going, please don't, God help him. Don't call on me to pray. God, please don't, don't call him. I was praying earnestly right there, right there. I was saying, God, oh, don't, no, I don't want to pray. I don't want but my dad was the pastor, so guess what? Every time, every time, uh, dad would be like, okay, Wayne, why don't you lead us in prayer? And so I was oh, God. And, uh, and so I, I eventually, I'm just admitting some real transparent stuff with you. I, I, don't, I don't know that uh, I'm not guilty of just really kind of sitting in the back of the room just in case he calls on me to pray. What am I going to say? Lord, God, help us. Lord, I pray you'd bless. And I just had to memorize that's a repetitious, insincere prayer. And, and I want you to understand, I'm, I'm, I don't want you to feel bad if, if you've had to learn like a structure of prayer or maybe you look at the model prayer. Some people read the model prayer, the Lord's prayer, and they think that, that Jesus was saying, pray these words. That's not what he says. He says, pray in this way. So Jesus was never saying, hey, pray this word, these words exactly. But, but what do we do? I mean, I can't tell you how many funerals I've been to where people legitimately, the whole crowd quotes the Lord's Prayer. It's not that that's terrible, but listen, that's not the point Jesus was trying to make. Jesus was trying to say, you need to learn to communicate with me. And here's like a template. <laughs> here's, here's some good things to include. Uh, you know, ideas when you're praying, when you're talking to me, this is the spirit in which you need to come uh, to, to communicate with me. But uh, so many times we, we need a crutch. We need some kind of framework. And so we're really bad about becoming repetitious in our prayers. Now understand, we can be sincere in repetition to some degree, but I wanna challenge you to really intentionally become sincere in your prayer life. And try to get away from the things you always say. Try to get away from your crutches, your word crutches. Try to get away from praying with the idea that you're praying so that everybody else would be impressed with your prayer. I'm telling you, that's a very big thing for us. I mean, I think it's difficult, even as a dad around their kids or a mom around the kids, and you're wanting to pray and teach the kids to pray. And so sometimes we, we pray, and, and it's more like we're praying. I don't mean praying for in a sense of God help other people, but we're praying for other people's approval. It's almost like we're, we're praying with them in mind. 
And, and that is not the way we're to pray. You know what? Prayer, prayer's communication. We're talking to God. We're just talking to God. And so even though it may seem extremely casual to some degree for us just to say, God, I love you. God, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just here to talk to you again because I desperately need to talk to you. Man, I've had a rough day. You know, I mean, you may say, well, that doesn't sound like a prayer at all. It's because we've made prayer something it's not. We've twisted it. We've made it religious. We've made it a, a, a repetitious, uh, mystical uh, ceremony rather than a conversation between us and the creator of the universe. And so while we should come to him in reverence, we should come to him with respect, obviously. We should also remember that it's not just sincerity that we're going after, but God also tells us to come to him personally. Like this is a personal thing. So the second directive is be personal. Don't just be sincere in your prayers. Be personal in your prayers. Remember that God has not just called us uh, to religion. He's called us to a relationship. And this relationship is a personal conversation. It involves a personal interaction with God. And so we understand this is not just about a, a church thing or, a, or a, a religious thing. This is about a relationship thing that somehow the God of the universe desires to hear us talk to him. And, and he desires us very much to be quiet and listen to him in, in, our, in our internal souls and our hearts to listen to the voice of God as he speaks to us and offer direction. Verse six, look at what it says. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Now, this is not saying that we can't pray publicly or we shouldn't pray publicly. In fact, you find plenty of other passages where you do see public prayer being not only initiated, but actually prescribed. We should, we should pray publicly as, as a church. Corporate prayer is very biblical. But understand what Jesus is trying to teach us is that when you're praying, even if it's publicly, it ought to be personal. When I'm praying and I'm talking to God, even if hundreds or thousands of people are listening, I've got to make sure that I'm remembering that my conversation, though it may be representing all of us at that time, I'm saying, God, we love you. But here's the deal. It's, I'm talking to God talking to God is a personal conversation. And if I forget that, if I lose sight of that, then I really disconnect in the relationship. And, and my motives are then called into question and God sees my heart. He knows everything. I mean, that's what the passage even says. So I can't hide it from him anyway. So I've got to make sure that my heart is right and that I am sincere. But then as I talk with him, I'm, I'm remembering that I am having a personal conversation with the God of the universe. And so the overarching point is that he, um, that he's trying to make his here is that we must check our motivation in prayer. That we need to make sure that what we're doing in every case, not just in prayer, but in every case of spiritual discipline, we're doing these things for the right reason. When we pray, we're praying because we love God and we want a deeper relationship with him. We want to know him more. We want, to, we want him to know us more. We, we desire for him to be pleased with us. And he says, we must pray. And so if, if somebody would say, well, Wayne, he's a sovereign God, he knows everything. In fact, it already says you got our, your father already knows what you need. So what's the point of praying? Wayne, why, why would we waste our time praying if God's gonna do what God's gonna do? And I would say, first of all, you probably have a, a pretty big misunderstanding of sovereignty of God and free will of man. But even beyond that, I would say the reason you should pray is because God told you to. God told me to. And so our number one reason for prayer is because it, it, it is pleasing to God. And so I go to God in prayer because he, he expects it of me. The religious hypocrites obviously prayed for public praise and admiration. And so this teaches us, this is one of the biggest surprises really as you read through the passage, is that uh, hypocrites love to pray. Did you know that? That's crazy, isn't it? It kind of hits me funny sometimes to think about. The hypocrites love to pray because the scripture literally says, don't be like the hypocrites for they love to stand and pray. What? Yeah. So that means just because you pray doesn't mean you're praying right. Just because, you, just because you're going through a religious activity doesn't mean you're actually pleasing God. You can say it like this. Just because you love to pray doesn't mean you love to do it God's way. 
And so with that in mind, we understand that God has not called us just to religious practice. He's called us to relationship. He's called us to a personal relationship with him. And so prayer must be uh, sincere. Prayer must be personal. Our conversation with Jesus should go far beyond the surface. And there's nowhere where this is an easier application than church life because we know we have church friends that we know, but we don't know, no. You know what I'm saying? There's no way in a church our size where you can, you can re- legitimately know everyone in a deep personal friendship way. I wish we could, that would be fantastic. But the problem is there, there are definitely people you pass in the lobby, maybe even people from another service or another connect group in the hallway and you pass them, you see them every week or, or so and, and you pass them and when you pass them, you're like, hey, how's it going? Good to see you again. You know, how's everything going? Whatever, very general. And you could even probably call it an acquaintance. That's an acquaintance, a relationship, sure, but not, not a deep relationship. <clears throat> there are other people that you know, and, and probably some in the church, some in your family, at home, uh, some in your neighborhood. Those relationships are deeper than that. They're not just acquaintances. I mean, when you talk to them at Connect Group, or when you're sitting beside them in worship, or you see them in the lobby, you grab a chair, and you sit at a table, and you talk. And you have a conversation. You actually say, you know, how, how's the family? Man, how's, how's your husband, your wife? How's, how's your kids? Now, I, I know you were not feeling good a couple weeks back. You feeling better now? I mean, you, you were in the hospital a month ago, or how's that going, you know? I mean, you know, you, here's the deal. You, you have a, a more intimate awareness of their life, and you're concerned about them. It's a relationship. That's a big difference. And I think, here's the thing. I think a lot of Christians approach prayer like the passing connect group member in the hallway. We're like, hey, hey God, uh, bless the food. Appreciate it, <laughs> you know? Or hey, uh, if I die before I wake, take me to heaven, amen? I appreciate that, you know? I mean, it's like that kind of very, very distant. It's like we look at, we look at prayer and we look at God as God is, is out there, he's up there, he's so far away, and, and I, there's no way that I can connect with him. And that's, that's the opposite of what prayer is. See, prayer is legitimately the, the reality that we can personally connect with him. Be sincere, be personal. Third and final, be dependent. Be dependent. And this is a core value of our church. It's one of our seven core values as a church is that we desperately want to demonstrate that we are dependent on God. And I know folks at home would agree with us in here today that there, there's no, been no time in my life, I don't, I don't think that I've ever um, been more aware of my dependency and our dependency on God than lately. Because our culture is absolutely crazy. Everything's going nuts and I'm so thankful that two days from now, we will have this election behind us and we will be able to say, thank the Lord, we can watch television without feeling like we're being attacked every five minutes by somebody. And I, I'm looking ahead to that, but here's what we have to understand, that Wednesday, if we're expecting to wake up and the birds chirp a little uh, louder and the sun shine a little brighter simply because your candidate won or lost, um, then, then I think again, we have missed the point. Um, because there's no man or woman that's ever gonna solve our problems. There's no political party that's gonna solve our problems. There's no church building or even group of people that'll solve our problems. Our dependency is on God. And so here's the thing, prayer is the best way that we can demonstrate to God that we believe that. That's the best way. I mean, you could name a lot of other things, for sure. Be obedient to God, come to church faithfully. All of that's true, I think God, evaluates that, he sees that, and he's like, boy, they love me because they want to be around people that love me. I mean, that's obvious, common sense, yeah. But prayer is actually talking to God. Prayer's talking to God. So there could be no better way for you to show that you admit, I acknowledge God, I'm dependent on you, and I'm gonna acknowledge that, and I'm gonna show my awareness of that because I'm gonna plead with you when I'm in a desperate situation. God, you're the first place I run. I am completely dependent on you. Now, there's a lot of ways to apply this, but because of time, I'm gonna just shoot straight to the closing, and here's how we're gonna do it today. 
I want you to really recognize and admit, though, that this is a personal thing. And after this service and after this week, let's remember that what we should learn from this is that we personally have an opportunity to connect with God and we can demonstrate our awareness of our dependence on God by praying. Personally, you need to be a man or woman of prayer. You need to be a a boy and a girl of prayer. God help us be faithful and demonstrate our dependence on him by being people of prayer. But having said that, today, two days before election day, I'm not gonna pray for God to give us a particular outcome, but I want us to pray for our country, all right? I want us to, as, as a church, pray for our country. And it may be that uh, you have a strong opinion of what God needs to do. Or let me say it like this, what God needs to allow. I'm going to really ask you to remember who God is and who God is not. God is not me. And God is not you. So God does not need to serve our wishes or our desires. And, and you know what? God does not need to do what we think is best. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is pray with me that God would would lead our church back to a position. Not that we were ever perfect. Look, we've always had our faults. And even in the midst of founding fathers doing many things right, they did many things wrong too. We've always been a a country of people who are, are sinners, just like we are today. But we're a country filled with people who are desperately in need of God. And so I want us to pray. And here's what we're going to do. I'm going to open up the altars. I've been really surprised, just to be honest with you, because of COVID-19. I want us to, to maintain safe distance in the altar. I don't want to, you know, pile up in a, in a group unless it's your family. That would be great. But I want you to have the freedom to come to the altar and pray without a feeling of obligation. I don't want you to feel guilted because obviously that, I don't think we'd all fit, all right? So feel comfortable praying where you are. Um, I'm going to begin and I'm going to voice a prayer for us collectively. But here's the deal. doesn't matter if you're at home or if you're in the balcony. Uh, I want you to pray with me. All right? Because we're, I'm not praying for you, not, not for your approval. I'm, I'm praying to God. I, I want to talk to God on our behalf. And I want you to do the same thing. And even though I got a microphone and you don't, guess what? God will hear you just as loud as he hears me. And so I want us to pray together, but then after I say amen, we're going to sing a song just like normal, and I want you to keep praying. We'll sing, I mean, sing sing a prayer through this song to God. You can stay in the altar as long as you want to, just to pray, God, help our country. God, help me as an American to be the man, the woman you called me to be, to be light, to remember that I'm first a Christian, second an American. God, bring us back. God, help us come into repentance to you. That'd be our prayer. And so uh, I just ask you, would you join me in praying right now? God, we love you. <clears throat> Lord, I, I recognize this is November 1st, and um, a lot of things have, have uh, been going crazy in our world. I mean, you know this better than anybody. God, we're in the midst of a, a crazy pandemic, uh, unlike anything I've ever lived through. So Lord, it's, so we're learning things as we go. We, we just don't, we ain't got it figured out. And, and God, we have a lot more questions sometimes than we do answers. But you've been so gracious to us, God. You've helped us every step of the way. You have guided us. Even as a church, I would be a fool not to say that it's only by your grace that we haven't had sicknesses greater than, than we already have. Um, you know, God, you have, any health that we have is because of you. So God, we, we just admit that today. But Lord, I do pray for our country, and I pray that we would continue as a church to pray for our country this morning. Um, not that we've ever been perfect, but God, there have been definitely been days where we were, we were closer to uh, your will for us than we are today. And I pray, God, that you would, you would carry, carry us back to where we need to be, Lord, that in repentance we would admit even failures we had before, but definitely failures we have now. And I pray we'd remember that, Lord... Uh, Joe Biden and and Donald Trump, they're not the solution that you are. God, help us. Help us remember that there's no man, woman, political party that's going to solve things. And and Wednesday morning, you're still Lord. God, you're on the throne. And so I pray that we would demonstrate our absolute dependence on you even now. God, help us. God, help our country. And I pray that you'd bring us back to be the people that you called us to be. We love you. 
I pray that your church would stand up and be the church that you've called us to be in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me?